The Locked On Podcast Network presents the NFL Big 3 in 30. The three biggest stories in the NFL from our local experts at the Locked On Podcast Network. We bring you the real story, why it matters, what's next, who wins the big game, and more, all in 30 minutes. The NFL Big 3 in 30 starts now with the biggest story in the NFL. The Baltimore Ravens needed a bounce back win and they absolutely got it. You are Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. 30 to 23, the final score. John Harbaugh victorious over Jim once again. And me being an oldest brother, I can fondly say that the older brother always wins. And that is what we saw here tonight. From John Harbaugh's squad, and it was a little dicey at the very beginning there with the defense letting up the opening drive touchdown of Justin Herbert and company, but the Ravens bounced back in a really big way, and this win is massive, and I was hyping it up all week on the show if you were listening, and I said, look, this is a massive game for multiple different reasons, and this team went out there, and not a, I mean, look, there were, there were complaints, but I thought that they did a lot well in this contest, so we'll obviously talk about the offense, we'll talk about the defense the whole nine yards. I think, first of all, where we have to start, Lamar Jackson just continues to find ways to be clutch when it matters. There were a couple of moments early in the game. The offense just sometimes early. In fact, it's been more than sometimes early. The the slow starts can be a little bit concerning on the offensive side of the ball, where it just feels like nothing is going right for them. And the Ravens have been held scoreless in the first quarter in five of their last six games. That stuff that if you want to establish momentum, you know, you, you got to be able to get out of some of your, your old bad habits like that. And we did see throughout the contest. I know that Carl Sheffers and his crew not usually known for throwing penalties or getting all flag happy, but I'll just, let's start there because it seemed like late in the game, the Chargers offensive strategy was just, Oh, Hey, screw it. Flags down there somewhere. <laughs> let's just, let's just go down and see if we can draw a flag. And it worked for him late. It resulted in an onside kick, but Look, I'm not. There were some pretty ticky tacky calls on both sides in this game, but then there were there were some real ones as well. 16 total penalties in this game. The Ravens nine for 102. Another poor penalty performance from then. Chargers seven for 62. So obviously, still Baltimore has to tighten up in that regard. I'm not trying to shy away from that fact whatsoever. But you know, you still have to be able to go out there and and do your job and perform at a high level. And look, this was a game that when you're fighting with a team for playoff seating for AFC standing. Now, this game, guess the Ravens, they took advantage of a bad Pittsburgh loss. This is exactly like that. Pittsburgh loss would have been all for naught, right? All for naught if the Ravens hadn't done their job, came out, and won this game. If they didn't do that, it would have been, okay, well, Pittsburgh loss, but so did Baltimore. And we'll talk about this a little more in the second part of the show. And we talk about, to me, how big of an AFC changing win this was for the Ravens. But it's just such a big deal that they got the job done here for their own playoff standing. And when it comes to seeding as well, that's going to be big. Because there are a couple of teams that Baltimore matches up very well with that this win puts them in prime position to play, whether they win the North or they don't. But getting back into the game in general... I mean, Lamar on the day, 16 to 22, 177 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Certainly missed some throws along the way, but had a bunch of big ones as well. Bunch of big plays also in terms of his rushing touchdown and a couple of, he, he amazes me every single week. And I know we're all kind of numb to it when it comes to him juking out somebody really impressively or making a cool play that only picks up two yards, but he goes and he runs around for 50 and makes a play. He had a couple of plays in this game where there was pressure in his face almost immediately. And he just jukes a guy out, does guy touches earth, and he goes and, and makes something happen out of it, gets a little check down option. And that's just the, the beauty of what Lamar Jackson can give you. Because I've been saying, if you've been listening to me here all week on Locked on Ravens back last week, what I was saying was it's a multi-step plan to bring down Lamar Jackson. First of all, you have to beat the Baltimore offensive line, but then you actually have to get Lamar Jackson on the ground. And getting Lamar Jackson on the ground, and not to mention even throwing Derrick Henry in that conversation, getting those two guys on the ground, those are two of the hardest things in football. And honestly, in my opinion, they are one and two. 
There are no two harder things in the league than bringing down Lamar Jackson and bringing down Derrick Henry. So I don't think Lamar was like a huge storyline in this game. Obviously, he made a bunch of winning plays and, you know, left a couple out there. But again, great throw to, to Bateman and incredible catch on that play by Rashad too, man. That was, that was unreal. Put these balls into places where guys could go and, and get them. But obviously, I see it in the comments a bunch. The big story here. Derrick Henry nearly six yards a carry, and there were times in the game where I was I was wondering, all right, Derrick Henry gets a, a big gain on three or four straight runs, and then they take him out of the game. What are we doing here? Though there were moments like that, but overall, Derrick Henry got the job done. And of course, the Ravens were trying to run clock control, trying to bleed the clock out, and they did it with the King himself 24 carries 140 yards for Derrick Henry no touchdowns very unfamiliar scene here for the Ravens no touchdowns for this team but then you have Justice Hill who had four for 55 Lamar Jackson not really a factor in the in the run game obviously did have the the touchdown run that was his big play there but the Chargers did a pretty good job of containing Lamar on the ground but that's not really been Lamar's game for most of the season right he's not running nearly as much as he has and honestly, that's kind of an afterthought. We're like, yes, the threat of him on the ground is still very real. The gravity, as we talk about of that, is still very, very real. But at the end of the day, what you have is a player that can annihilate you in, in so many different ways. So Baltimore averaged 5.7 yards per carry on the ground. The two running backs, Henry, I mentioned 5.8. Justice, 13.8, including that incredible 51-yard play. And again, Justice wasn't really getting much going on the ground other than that. He had four for 55, and one of those was a 51-yard play. So you do that math. The other carries were three for four yards. But what I noticed out of this Chargers group is something I've noticed all year from defenders is guys just do not want to tackle Derrick Henry. You saw these guys going for weak leg tackles and Henry was just stiff arming them out of the way saying, get out of here. Like that to me, that, that's the, that's the game plan. Give the ball to Derrick Henry. You have to be such a physical defensive front to be able to stop Derrick Henry consistently. And the chargers had moments in the game where they did, they, they, they had moments in the game where, you know, Henry was being tackled for losses or they read plays out. But for the most part, Derrick Henry did a great job of getting to the second level, picking up that head of steam. And Derrick Henry is the most dangerous when he's able to go out there and get to the second level, get to the third level and break one. Because the more speed and the more momentum that Derrick Henry picks up over the course of this game or the course of any game, the more deadly he is. So I thought it was a great game from the Ravens on the ground. And again, despite moments where, Todd Munkin and the offense weren't using him when he was cooking. I thought that they got back to it in the second half, and that's what it is. The Ravens are a second-half team. Honestly, the Ravens are a third-quarter team, what we're going to call it here. The Ravens are a third-quarter sometimes, but generally not a fourth-quarter team. The Ravens are a third-quarter team. That's what I'm going to say. Late second, late, like, late, almost like second quarter to end of third quarter, that's the Ravens' sweet spot because they start slow. Sometimes they end slow and they can't finish games, but then you get into that sweet spot of like second, third quarter, and that is where you go if you're the Ravens and your your sweet spot, your success zone. So really interesting that Baltimore still just gets off to these slow starts offensively. Then you have Zay 5 for 62, Mark 5 for 44, and that score Rashad 2 for 43. Again, not like a big stats day. But the Ravens still put up 30 points. Still put up 30 points. Lamar throws a 177. The Ravens still put up 30 points. So that's what it is. Now defensively, look, I think a lot of people saw the start from Lee Harrison in this game, myself included, and said, all right, going to be a long day for this defense. Going to be a long day for Malik Harrison without Roquan Smith being the anchor or one of the anchors of that defense. I think Malik Harrison finished the game as one of the best, if not the best player on the field for the Ravens on Monday night, which shout out to Malik, man. I mean, look, it was a tough start. You know, we weren't seeing crazy. We weren't, we weren't being crazy out there. Malik had some tough plays early in the game, but I thought that he responded really well. That whole linebacker group. I thought Chris board had a great game. I thought that linebacker group rallied, right? I thought they did. And look, I love it when players go out there and either prove me wrong or, you know, make me eat tweets or eat words or whatever. 
I was being a lot of people were being harsh on Malik Harrison early in this game. They needed him to step up and play well in the absence of Roquan. But I thought that Malik did a great job of establishing his physicality as the game went on and punishing. I thought the linebacker core punished people, Chris Board and Malik Harrison in particular. So I really thought, and I see all up and down in the comments, you know, shout out to Chris Board. Malik showed up. Yeah, 100 percent, thousand percent. That is something that this team needed. And so Malik finishes with 13 tackles, led the team by a wide margin. Nate Wiggins finishes second on the team with six tackles, and he had a bunch of big pass breakups on Josh Palmer, and they tested him deep in this game. And while Justin Herbert was not making very effective throws deep in the deep, you know, 20 plus yards down the field, Nate Wiggins did hold his own, and I thought Nate played really well. Well, the Ravens secondary played really well. You look at the Chargers stats here. I don't think Justin Herbert played a very good game. He made some plays. He made some plays. He extended plays. He knew when to step up in the pocket and found guys. And it's not all on Justin, obviously. I do want to put that out there. Quentin Johnston was the worst player on the field tonight. The worst player. And we all need to be sending, I hope I hope we all can rat, rat, gather around here and rally is, is Ravens people. We can send a gift basket over to the Chargers facility for them drafting Quentin Johnston over Zay Flowers in the 2023 draft. They had the opportunity. Only Jackson Smith and Jigbo was gone. They had the, their pick between Zay Flowers, Jordan Addison, and Quentin Johnston, and they picked the wrong guy. Quentin Johnston has had a resurgent year in Los Angeles this season. I'm not saying he hasn't, but he almost single-handedly lost the Chargers multiple different scores on multiple different possessions and was really bad. Finished the game, five targets, no catches for no yards. That's how bad he was. Yep. And yep, Maximilian, I agree with this. That first drop changed the game. It did. And Justin Herbert missed a couple of reads on that play that he tried to get the ball to Josh Palmer early in the game. It was seven, nothing charged at the time. Well, he had Josh Palmer running right across his face but he made a decision because he saw the Ravens pressure and he couldn't get the ball out or he got the ball out too quickly, excuse me. And he misses on a wide open touchdown opportunity and they have to settle for three. So essentially they leave 14 points on the board and they get three. I believe, I don't think any points came out of the Johnston drive. Maybe it was another field goal. So they left either 11 or eight points on the board in a seven point loss. So Yay. Thank you to Los Angeles for taking Quentin Johnson over Zay Flowers. But I thought that the Ravens defense stepped up big time. And look, I'll say it. Chargers offense, well, I don't think they're as good as they've shown. They haven't really played a bunch of good teams this season, especially, you know, defensively. I don't think that defense is as good either. But the Chargers offense is a lot better than Pittsburgh's offense. And Baltimore, aside from that crazy last possession, and things get weird on those last possessions. Ravens defense stepped up and, and did their job. Game time has a new feature for your ticket buying experience called game time picks that makes getting tickets to your favorite live events even easier. Game time picks filters out the fluff to show you only the incredible deals on great seats. So you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. No one wants to do that. Curation makes it easier to save more, to save time, to save money on concerts, sports, comedy, theater, and more near you. You take the guesswork out of buying tickets with GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On for $20 off. Download GameTime today. What time is it? Game time. The Chargers had their biggest test of the season on Monday Night Football against the Ravens. And you are Locked On Chargers, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Chargers. Man, that's a tough one to swallow. It really is, yeah. I mean, the Chargers get off to a hot start. Everything looks really, really good on Monday Night Football. And then the Ravens just decided to give the ball to Derrick Henry. And that <laughs> completely changed kind of the trajectory of the game for the Chargers. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, they kind of out physical the Chargers and and beat them up most of the night. Yeah, I mean, it did feel like they get bullied. They got bullied a little bit. And I mean, we know the Jim Harbaugh's teams pride themselves in being physical, but just felt like they didn't really have the horsepower to to handle it on either side of the football. And the Ravens have been playing that brand of football for a lot longer and a lot more consistently. But 
Make sure you guys check out FanDuel because you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. New customers can place a $5 bet and you'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. David, it's not just the loss, it's how you lose, right? I think which is the most disappointing part of this one because I think being, me and you both felt going into this, it's like, hey, if the Chargers lose to a really good team, sometimes it can be as simple as that. I think the the jarring kind of eye-opening part of this loss specifically was just the way that they lost, right? The way that they got bullied. And the Chargers, it's not like this is the first game their run defense has struggled, but a lot of times they were good enough to not really have it be a huge issue, right? They've won four games in a row. They've had some really bad run defense games in there, but they were good enough to overcome it until they ran into a team that was willing to do it and do it over and over and over again and to the tune of Derrick Henry running all over them, 24 carries, 140 yards, 5.8 yards per carry. Overall, 37 carries for 212 yards and two touchdowns. A Jim Harbaugh team had never allowed 200 rushing yards in a game. And it just sucks to see them kind of get phys- out physical, manhandled the way that they did. I mean, they just they couldn't get a stop when they needed it. Every time they had a fourth and short, right? Three different fourth and ones that could have got them off the field. Can't get off the field on any of them. And it just sucked to watch it go down the way that it did. Yeah, the, the Chargers got beat up um, after the first couple drives. You know, the, the Chargers uh, had some success because the the Ravens were you know really kind of throwing the football first and kind of running it. You know, as yeah. I mean, they had that motion. bad penalty too, right? I mean, yeah. they got a little lucky earlier. The leg whip penalty kind of threw them yeah. out of their game, but it did seem like they had a solid game plan until they didn't. Yeah, until they didn't exactly, and and that's when. You know, the Ravens said, oh, well, let me just go ahead and hand the ball off to Derrick Henry over and over and over. And the Chargers, you know, they surrendered the edge. They, they missed tackles. They couldn't get him on the ground. When they did get into third and long situations, they were not able to get off the football field, um, which was absolutely brutal. You know, it's really, really hard. It's really demoralizing when you do everything you're supposed to do to get a team in the third and long situation and fourth down situation, and you can't get them off the football field. It's backbreaking. It hurts it hurts your momentum, uh, hurts your mental too, because you're like, man, what do I got to do to get these guys off the field? And just, I mean, it must have felt like a really long night for the Chargers defense because they were going backwards pretty much the entire night. Yeah, and I mean, that's what makes this Ravens offense so difficult because, I mean, Lamar Jackson can light you up through the air. He didn't really need to in this game, but they could just pound the rock, and if you're going to allow 5.8 yards per carry, they're just going to keep continuing to do it, and it wasn't oh, yeah. just the defense by any means. I mean, I was surprised by the Chargers coming out hot with their rushing attack offensively, but the second half, they got out physical that the line of scrimmage the the interior of the offensive line became a much bigger problem penalties started racking up because they were getting beat and having to hold they just got out physical they got outplayed in the trenches they got bullied by john harbaugh and the ravens and really just the disappointing part is just you miss such an, an opportunity to have that we have arrived moment because yeah say what you will about the seven and three record going into it the chargers didn't have a statement win on their resume they just didn't. The teams that they beat were bad. The only 500 team that was better than 500 this season was the Broncos. And that's not one that is going to prove to anyone that, hey, you're a, a for real team, right? Nobody's taking that and saying, okay, yeah, you're one of the best because this right. Ravens team went and blew the Broncos out when they played them. But after going up 10 points in this game, the Chargers were outscored 30 to 9 until they ended up getting that garbage touchdown late in the game, which doesn't really count for much, right? Like that no. just... It didn't really feel like, you know, a real touchdown or anything that you can really salvage. This game wasn't as close as the final score would tell you. But it also just kind of felt like they were outclassed a little bit, David. It didn't feel like they really had enough talent on either side of the ball that if they came up against this Baltimore Ravens team or really any of the any of the big AFC teams, like if you get any of the Ravens or the Chiefs or the Bills on your best night, I don't know if they can keep up. And I think that was kind of the hard pill to swallow in this one was just like, hey, the Chargers came out good, seemed to have a good game plan. But at the end, they, they didn't have enough to keep up on either side of the football. Yeah, I mean, they had some steam early, you know, when they get off, off to the big lead, but they just didn't have enough steam to be able to push it through for four quarters. And I think that's the difference here. And yes, it is de- deflating. It is disappointing when you have an opportunity to make a statement to you know say hey you know we we can go beat a good team you know we can uh you know assert ourselves and, and make a statement unfortunately they were not able to do that tonight and you know it's just another another you know opportunity missed for the chargers 
to you know say that hey i'm a, a i'm a for real threat you know I, yeah. I'm, I'm here to meet the moment um they still uh, unfortunately you know with this game included have not been able to meet the moment so unfortunately we don't have any other recourse but to say that this chargers team isn't ready to compete at that level yet because they have not proven that they have been able to do so yeah, I just think that you kind of saw the gap a little bit. And I know the Ravens were 7-4 and four going into this one. They have some fluky losses, but that's a good team, man. And I said going into it that I thought it was the best team that they were going to play this season when you're just talking about the total talent. They were missing some of their big dogs just like the Chargers were as well. So yeah. feel bad for the, the great fan turnout that came out again to SoFi Stadium to have them kind of see the Chargers not be able to really stay close and, and make it a game late. That sucks, right? Because the, the Chargers fans have done such a great job at getting out there and giving this team a home field advantage. And I think what you saw in this game, frankly, was just the Chargers flaws getting exposed. Like all of their biggest flaws, all of the things that kind of worried us throughout the season, but they were able to overcome versus the bad teams really got put under the spotlight in this one. And it's like, yeah, I mean, that is, uh, you know, they, they aren't there yet in, in a lot of those ways. Now, they can still improve. This team isn't a finished product, even with the roster that they have right now. It doesn't mean that they can't get better and potentially make the playoffs and go for a run. And I think that's an important thing to keep in context here because we're going to get into it, right? There were several key turning points in this game on both sides of the football where the Chargers could have turned this thing into a game and it could have been really close. Obviously, the officiating we're going to talk about as well. Several plays that, that should have gone the Chargers way that didn't, that really kind of changed the way the game was going and, and really help the Ravens kind of bury them late in this game. But I think as far as the big picture goes, like this team is still ahead of schedule, right? This is a team that got put in a, a terrible salary cap situation and a team that got five wins last year. They had to sign a bunch of one-year deals and, and veteran minimum deals to try to put this team together and build a roster. It's not where it needs to get yet. And I think the other great thing is, is, hey, you have a game in Kansas City. Not that I'm looking over, you know, overlooking the Falcons at all. But if you want a statement win in the AFC, you've got to give him an arrowhead in a couple of weeks where you can prove it then. Yeah, you absolutely do. Uh, and yeah, you're not going to overlook any opponent. Obviously, the, the Falcons are, you know, they got some weapons on, on that football team. They can show up and definitely, you know, pick up a win against the Chargers. But the, the Chargers do have that that kind of big opportunity on that big stage. You know, that's going to be another primetime game for the Chargers. Um, and yeah, I think that's the biggest test that's remaining left on the schedule. That's the, the kind of last real regular season moment to be able to say, I am here. I am legitimate. I am a team that needs to be worried about. You have to game plan for me. You have to worry about me. That's the, the, the type of win that you need to have in order to be able to instill that fear into those opponents that you might be able to or you might be playing in the postseason. Yeah, and I just think when you look at this team and you look at, hey, where have the big wins for this team been even pre-Jim Harbaugh era? Like now we're going on almost two years, of the, you know, since the Chargers have beat a real legitimate top of the AFC type of team. I mean, it might even be 2021 yeah. in Kansas City when the Chargers took down the Chiefs. Like that might be where you'd have to look at when you're looking for that signature win. But uh, hey, I mean, the goal, I think, hasn't changed, right? With this team, we knew they were flawed. We didn't think they were going to win the AFC West. And the goal has always been this team could be a playoff team, get to the playoffs and see what happens. But it doesn't yeah. make this loss any less disappointing. And that's why I want to talk about the offense, because I thought they really underwhelmed with a great matchup for Justin Herbert. And man, Quentin Johnston, after a season for, you know, off season worth of trying to build that goodwill back, felt like it all went away on one play. Game time has a new feature for your ticket buying experience called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets to your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only the incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. No one wants to do that. Curation makes it easier to save more, to save time, to save money on concerts, sports, comedy, theater, and more near you. You take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game time. Has New York Giants head coach Brian Dable lost the locker room? We're gonna you are Locked On Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. I'm not even going to talk in detail about what we saw today. Uh, between the Giants and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers because, you know, I feel like every week 
I say the same thing about the shortcomings of this team, you know, what goes wrong. It's just, it's the same thing. It's Groundhog Day, as far as I'm concerned. Every time I have to do one of these shows after a game. What I want to talk about, however, is I want to take a look at the locker room. Has the locker room been lost? Has head coach Brian Dable lost the locker room? I'm going to give you my two cents based on, you know, the vibe I got in the post-game locker room, um, things I've heard, and just observations. Um, then in segment two, we'll talk about changes that desperately need to be made. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on segment three, we'll take a look ahead. Uh, the Giants on a short work week, and we'll just kind of take a little bit of a look ahead, and you'll you'll see what I mean when I get to that segment. So that's our schedule for today. Again, thank you for joining me. Has Brian Dable lost the locker room? Now, look, I want to start off by saying, you know, I like Brian Dable as a person. I do think he's got some merit as a head coach. I really do. But that said, I was a little perturbed by some of the things that I heard coming out of the locker room today. All right. Um, now, granted, only Malik Neighbors was directly criticized the coach, basically said, you know, ask Dable why I'm not getting the ball. And for what it's worth, I'm not surprised that Malik Neighbors was the only one who really came out and said that because there have been little signs of Malik Neighbors just boiling over all along. And it, I'm not going to lie, it was a concern for me because I go back to Hard Knocks when we saw, you know, the interview with Malik Neighbors, you know, the, the draft, uh, or not the draft, the pre-draft stuff at the Combine, how Neighbors just, you know, certain things he said just kind of made me say, okay, if things go sour and he comes to this team, it could get ugly. But that said, I understand where Malik Neighbors is coming from. So he's frustrated, as is everybody else in the locker room. But here's why I think Brian Dable is losing this locker room or has lost this locker room. Every single week after a loss, it's we got to go back to work. We got to trust the process. We got to do this. We got to do that. Well, guess what? The process ain't working, folks. If it was working, you know, the results would maybe be different. And it's not. OK, it's the same results week after week after week. We see missed tackles. We see blown assignments, drop balls, you name it, lack of effort, whatever the case may be. This process is not working. And you sit there and you wonder, what did they do during the bye week? They were supposed to evaluate all this stuff. What did they do? What did they change up? Based on the results of today's game, I'd say nothing. I'd say the only thing maybe they worked on was whether or not, you know, to get rid of Daniel Jones or not. Okay? They got rid of him. That didn't seem to solve the problem. Tommy DeVito, you know, didn't really have a chance. It wasn't totally DeVito's fault. The, the offensive line wasn't that great. But DeVito also, uh, there were times when I saw him hold on to the ball a little too long, which reminded me of Daniel Jones. Uh, but, look. The process, this whole thing about trust the process, the process doesn't work with this group. And to keep going back to it and doing it the same thing over and over and over and get the same results, what do they call that? Insanity? So right off the bat, I'm like, if I'm a player in that locker room and the coach is telling me, just pr trust the process, just trust the process, I'm like, look, dude. I'm putting my body on the line here. I'm getting beat up while some of these other guys are not giving their all. What process? Throw the process out the window and, and think of something else. That's why you get paid the big bucks. And, you know, you, you we heard um, Jermaine Illuminor. We heard um, Darius Slayton, Brian Burns, Dexter Lawrence all say the same thing. They all question some of the effort. By some of their teammates. They all had, you know, doubts about it. Jermaine Illuminor was probably the most direct in saying that, you know, he doesn't think everybody's given a full effort. Who do you think that's on? The players, yes, but the coach, 
You think maybe the coach would, would take these guys aside and, or see this and say, hey, you're not giving a full effort? Go sit your butt down on the bench. So, you know, I just feel like things are spiraling out of control within the locker room. Um, I feel like Brian Dable's message to trust the process is falling on deaf ears. And I'm not sitting here and saying I blame the players because, again, these guys, you know, there are enough guys in that locker room and the majority of the guys, I would say, come in and they do give a, a, a rat's you-know-what about putting forth the best effort. And it's so frustrating. It's kind of like, you know, if you're on a team and you, you have five people on a team, let's say, and four of the five are pulling their weight and the fifth person's just coasting right along, that creates resentment. That can create splintering. That can create bigger issues that already exist in the locker room. So I just feel like, you know, Brian Dable got to get control of this. He's got to get a hold of this. You know, the processes aren't working. Um, whether he gives a different message, I don't know what that is at this point. I mean, quite honestly, the season, six more games, it can't come, you know, the end can't come soon enough as far as I'm concerned if we're going to continue to see this type of play. But Dable, you know, and, and here's the other thing that I'll point out about Dable. He came in here, he was hired for this job as an offensive guru, a guy who was a quarterback whisperer. Well, did he totally fix Daniel Jones? No. Think about it, folks. Daniel Jones had his best year. Who was calling the plays? Wasn't Brian Dable. It was Mike Kafka. And I know about last year, you're going to say, well, what about last year? Well, last year, you know, the injuries and stuff, you could throw last year out. But this year, you saw Daniel struggle. This week, you saw Tommy DeVito struggle. Tommy DeVito, to me, didn't look any better than Daniel Jones has. And again, I know the offensive line didn't play well, but those times when DeVito maybe did have an opportunity, held on to the ball too long. So what are we doing here? You know, I mean, isn't this what Dable was brought in for to help fix the quarterback situation, to help get this offense explosive? And he hasn't. The scores, the, the average sco points scored per game speaks for itself. This offense is worse with Dable, the architect of this offense, calling the plays. How that is possible, I have no idea. But here we are. Here we are, folks.